The comet's tail spread across the dawn, a red slash that bled above the crags of Dragonstone like a wound in the pink and purple sky. That's the very first line of A Clash of Kings. It follows the events at the end of book one. Wait, you don't read your books latest to earliest? And it reminds <laughs> us this is a fantasy series. I mean, if you had forgotten dragons, I mean. Somehow, though, fantasy series doesn't really describe it well at all. Yeah, saying A Song of Ice and Fire is fantasy is like saying Pulp Fiction is about a briefcase or that Star Wars is about the Force. Middle Earth without the One Ring uh, could and has been quite engaging, some of the uh, side stories. But the main storyline would not exist without the One Ring. That's just, it's, it's just impossible. It would be a much different story. There isn't a single event that George put in the books uh, that, would, that are vital to the rest of the series. Take away the dragons or the others, and you still have the Game of Thrones. And that would have still been a great series, I think. But we do get dragons and others and the Game of Thrones, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, but more importantly, we have living, breathing characters whose actions are what truly interest us. Uh, fantasy is the setting, you might say, but it does not do justice as a standalone description because the fantasy elements are just that. Elements. The comet is a microcosm of this. It's a paranormal event of significance, but the compelling moments are the characters' reactions to the comet, not the comet itself. Ultimately, though, the comet may be no more than a wondrous sight, devoid of magic or divine origin, but, as the blackfish points out to Catelyn, That's blood up there, child, smeared across the sky. Our blood or theirs? Was there ever a war where only one side bled? Point being, whatever the reason for the comet, if any, the result will be blood and fire. The world is full of superstitious and violent people, and plenty of them had plenty of time to let their co collective imaginations run wild as to its meaning. A regular comet would be ominous enough, <laughs> but a previous comet heavily influenced Rhaegar Targaryen himself. But this is something greater. <laughs> had Rhaegar lived, he might be saying, okay, now that's the comet I was looking for. <laughs> So, in this episode, we'll, though we'll get at whether or not the comet is magic or sent by a god or completely random, the indisputable reality is that people will think it means something. If it's a lie, we fight on that lie. <laughs> that's, the, that's the way of things. So, hello and welcome to another episode of History of Westeros podcast. A podcast dedicated to George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series, as well as HBO's Game of Thrones. Today's episode is History of Religion and Magic, Part 1, The Comet. That's right. Well, The purpose of this episode is twofold. Well, we're preparing a host of episodes devoted to religion, magic, host. prophecy, <laughs> but we needed to start with one, you know? And possibly we have to have another at the end to tie it all up. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Good Bookends. chance. Uh, we needed to start with one to, in to introduce the topic. We also needed space to discuss all of these things together, to look at similarities and, in general, to see things from a higher level. Looking at the big picture, in other words. Yeah. It occurred to us that the comet is a wonderful vehicle for this because all the major religions have an opinion on it. And it's the one event in all the series that everyone is a witness to. We wanted to cover religion, magic, and prophecy, and the comet has significant association with all three. It's perfect, really. Thanks, George. As we move along, we'll tease you on what to expect throughout the rest of this series. Some of the teasing will be a bit mean. Yeah, we're going to ruthlessly yeah. tease you in some As spots. our aim <laughs> is, of course, to make you lie awake in bed thinking about A Song of Ice and Fire. Of course, I mean, some of you probably do that already. So in your case, we'll be feeding the habit. Yeah, <laughs> beware. Pay close attention to these teasers, though, uh, because we might miss a few things. Remember, this is a lot of this is overview. We're starting to realize that you, our audience, mm -hmm. thank you, uh, are great with detail and with helping us cover all the bases. Of course, you guys probably wouldn't be that interested in this podcast if you weren't interested in detail. You're only now re realizing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so pat yourselves on the back, folks. You're a particularly smart group, and we can't pat you on the back because you're too far away. There, mm -hmm. can't reach through the screen like that. Um, your feedback and donations have are really vital to keeping us going, uh, especially donations of time as well as money. Um, really, to clarify. Uh, so be sure to let us know if a topic or subtopic that you're expecting to see referenced on here in part one isn't. Uh, that way we can throw it in mm -hmm. for the future episodes. 
So keep that in mind. So moving along, uh, shifting point of views, I think we can all agree, is one of the great things about A Song of Ice and Fire. Whoa. <laughs> and kittens are one of the great <laughs> things about life. Yes, that's true. <laughs> and the comet, though, is one of the only is the only event that everyone witnesses together. It gives us a unique chance to compare perspectives. Everyone has an opinion on what the comet means. And most of the points of view reveal views from other characters around them, too. So not just from the points of views from the surrounding characters. Uh, so we see a really, truly large set of reactions. It's probably no surprise that these interpretations vary wildly. Mm -hmm. Though some are eerily similar to one another. Yeah, we'll get to some of those as we go through that. You'll see some of these kind of crazy... Uh, coincidences, we'll call them. Uh, yeah, yeah. This series, series full of magic and stuff. It's, everything's a coincidence, right? <laughs> so, start with Little Shireen says to Maester Cresson. Dallas said she heard the Red Woman tell Mother that it was Dragon's Breath. If the dragons are breathing, doesn't that mean they're coming back to life? First off, yes, actually, Shireen. It appears to mean just that. The dragons have come to life, and they may be coming to eat you soon, um, <laughs> if your dreams are uh, at all accurate. But we wanted to focus on Crescent's response to her. While he says, The thing in the sky is a comet, sweet child. A star with a tail, lost in the heavens. It will be gone soon enough, never to be seen again in our lifetimes. Watch and see. What he thinks is actually, the maester did not believe in omens. And yet, old as he was... Crescent had never seen a comet half so bright, nor yet that color, that terrible color, the color of blood and flame and sunsets. Had a lifetime's hard-won wisdom fled him, along with his health and strength? He was a maester, trained and chained in the great citadel of Old Town. What had he come to when superstition filled his head as if he were an ignorant field hand? Maesters by nature are used to dismissing supernatural notions with rational explanations. And I suppose in Westeros they get plenty of experience, um, given the level of superstition that's already present in the common mind. But this time he felt unable to place the common in a rational framework. His experience in logical mind was overwhelmed as he tried to calm his own misgivings. And yet, and yet, the comet burned even by day now. White pale gray steam rose from the hot vents of Dragonmont behind the castle. And yestermorn, a white raven had brought word from the citadel itself. Word long expected, but no less fearful for all that. Word of summer's end. Omens all. Too many to deny. Since we've seen the comet through the eyes of a very old man, why not through our youngest female point of view? The comet was splendid and scary all at once. The red sword, the bull named it. He claimed it looked like a sword, the blade still red hot from the forge. When Arya squinted the right way... She could see the sword, too. Only it wasn't a new sword. It was ice, her father's great sword, all ripply Valyrian steel, and the red was Lord Eddard's blood on the blade after Ser Illin the King's justice had cut off his head. So, we've heard from an old man and a young girl. So, how about a middle-aged eunuch? Aziz? Hey. <laughs> I'm... I'm not middle-aged. No. <laughs> okay, I am. Out on the King's Road, it seemed to cover half the sky, outshining the crescent moon. In the streets, they call it the Red Messenger, Varys said. They said it comes as a herald before a king to warn of fire and blood to follow. Of course, right after that, Tyrion goes into his famous, or rather Varys, gives Tyrion his famous riddle about the three men and the sellsword. <laughs> so we kind of get distracted from the, uh, the comet there. Kind of a common tactic for George to throw something important and then to distract us with something else. But that's what rereads are for. <laughs> Interestingly, the Tully men are calling it the Red Messenger as well. So we got two nicknames from uh, two different groups of people that are somewhat far apart. So this is either a coincidence or an indication that the comet stayed in the sky for many days or weeks, which I think it does. <laughs> giving, uh, so in other words, it gave time for the nickname to kind of spread around a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it even outshines the crescent moon, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, that's a we lot. also have <laughs> numerous references to it being visible in broad daylight, and it, certainly it is portrayed that way on TV. Right. It's almost ridiculous to consider in this light, pun intended, <laughs> flaming rock in the sky, huh? Everyone fight! <laughs> okay, to be fair, though, a lot of the fighting had already started. War of the yeah. five, King, five Kings was underway, Ned was already dead, and the Whispering Wood and Battle of the Camps already fought. Right. We know this because Maester Lewin is actually the first one to see it. 
Um, it, it's actually kind of sneaks past. He doesn't reference what he's looking at. It just, he just we're just told he's looking at a comet through Brand's mm-hmm. point of view. And re- later on a reread, you may realize, oh, that's he's the first guy to notice the red comet. How about that? So he's using a telescopy thing. Uh, it's some sort of telescope. I don't know. Well, let's call it a telescope. It's <laughs> some sort of thing. I don't know. Uh, he's, so he's, able, he's that's the only reason he's able to see it. It's still too far off, and that's why he's the first one to, to take note of it. Not as you <laughs> might expect, there aren't very many telescopes in West Coast. <laughs> Um, so this is this, but this is the same chapter when he's noticing the comet where word reaches Winterfell that Lord Eddard has been executed. Um, of course, the interesting uh, sidebar to that is that Brandon Ricken had both shared a dream of that event happening, and dreams are something we're, we'll be getting into a bit later and in another episode <laughs> as part of this series. Mm-hmm. Lots of stuff there. But prior to the comet becoming fully visible, many important figures had yet to take the stage. And for many, the comet lit the way. It was seen as a herald by many, and it played that role both as a narrative concept and within the confines of the story itself. Put more simply, the comet helped introduce several characters and storylines. Yeah, it was a herald for the storyline and for the characters (laughs) within and without. It it does everything. It's a one-stop, do-everything plot device. (laughs) (laughs) Stannis Baratheon is Azor Ahai, come again, the warrior of fire. In him, the prophecies are fulfilled. The red comet blazed across the sky to herald his coming, and he bears Lightbringer, the red sword of heroes. A rousing introduction for Stannis. Melisandre is confident as always. Catelyn, not so much. (laughs) Edmure thinks it's an omen of victory for Riverrun. He sees a fish with a long tail in the tully colors, red against blue. She sighed. I wish I had their faith. Crimson is a Lannister color. Well, Catelyn was right. <laughs> Melisandre, not so much. Once again, how Stark suffers for being on the side of truth. Uh, in the case of Danny and her blood riders, just before the birth of the dragons, at first they saw the comet as a traditional Dothraki star representing Khal Drogo's ascent to the Nightlands, uh, burning so brightly in the sky because he burned so brightly in life. Yes, uh, Jogo spied it first. There, he said in a hushed voice, Danny looked and saw it, low in the east. The first star was a comet, burning red, blood red, fire red, the dragon's tail. She could not have asked for a stronger sign. Now, several individual characters claim that the comet is a sign for them. The ego on some of these people. (laughs) Yeah, right. If you think Theon was unbelievably stupid and trying to hold Winterfell, just keep this in mind. Theon had never seen a more stirring sight. In the sky behind the castle, the fine red tail of the comet was visible through thin, scuttling clouds. All the way from River Run to Seaguard, the Malisters had argued about its meaning. It is my comet, Theon told himself. We'll pause for a moment while you finish laughing at that. <laughs> yeah, Theon. <Okay. laughs> Crescent even considered it was for him, sleepily, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> Yet when he closed his eyes, he could still see the light of the comet, red and fiery and vividly alive amidst the darkness of his dreams. Perhaps it is my comet, he thought, drowsily at the last, just before sleep took him. An omen of blood, foretelling murder. Yes. Yes, murdering yourself. (laughs) Nice wine, at least. (laughs) (laughs) To be fair, though, Danny also thought the comet was for her. The Dothraki named the comet Shirak Kia, the Bleeding Star. The old men muttered that if that it omened ill, but Daenerys Targaryen had seen it first on the night she had burned Khal Drogo, the night her dragons had awakened. It is the herald of my coming, she told herself, as she gazed up into the night sky with wonder in her heart. The gods have sent it to show me the way. The Red Star sent you into the Red Waste, Danny, and <laughs> Karth. Show you the way indeed. <laughs> show you the long way. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, but compared to Theon and Crescent, Danny had just miraculously birthed three dragons, perhaps single-handedly returning, the, uh, returning magic to the world. So we can say she has sufficient street credibility uh, to be cocky. <laughs> Speaking of cocky, Theon's common <laughs> co- thoughts came just after he came from getting head from a merchant captain's daughter. <laughs> oh. Doesn't really measure up, Theon. Measure Maybe up. if Theon birthed three baby Krakens, he would be worthy of a comment. <laughs> then, finally, his father would approve and love him. Well, maybe. If he wasn't dead. <laughs> yeah, if he wasn't dead. 
One person had the comment named for him, in a sense. The Black Brothers had dubbed the Wanderer Mormont's Torch, saying only half in jest that the gods must have come to send it to light the old man's way through the haunted forest. The comment's so bright you can see it by day now. The Night's Watch example contains a generic reference to the gods, which seems common enough in Westeros. Yeah. Phrases such as the old gods and the new indicate there's relative peace between those two particular belief systems. But it wasn't always so. The interplay between religions is as important as, and deeply connected to, the relationship between religion and politics. So let's have a historical overview of religion in Westeros. The first man came to Westeros perhaps five to 10,000 years ago. Nice wide range there. <laughs> and there are belief, uh, brief glimpses of the old beliefs, but whatever those were, they took up worship of the old gods from the children of the forest. At this time, it's possible that the gods of Geese and perhaps Valyria, that's gods of Giscari people, not gods of, you know, yeah. geese, like Canadian geese. We don't care about Canada. their gods. <laughs> and perhaps, so Valyria as well, their gods were probably well established and worshipped widely. Uh, some of these parallels between development, developing nations and cultures were not exactly clear when these things happened, but it seems pretty straightforward enough. Um, Relorism, a monotheistic oppositional style religion, uh, it may have been relatively new at this time, which could still mean it was 500 <laughs> years or more old or something. Uh, new in terms of religion is, is kind of a uh, different than new in terms of other things. The, the range is a bit wider. But the religion of the drowned god is also monotheistic with two gods locked in eternal war. So there's a bit of a similarity there. Uh, worship of the drowned god goes back uh, to the time of the first men. The their initial settlement there, in fact. So it's, it's not quite as old as the religion of the old gods, but it might be older than the religion of uh, the seven. So the Roinar and their gods also existed long ago, and, and few kept those gods upon arriving in Westeros. Those were mostly forgotten and left behind, although there's some traces of them here and mm -hmm. still in Essos, which we see through some of the Tyrian chapters. Um, but the Andals eventually migrated to Westeros, and if the tales of seven-pointed stars carved into their chests, yeah. like you know, in the flesh, not not like on their armor or something. If that's accurate, it sounds like these guys were pretty zealotrous. They were really into their religion and they were really into spreading it. And it's no wonder that they burned all these trees and killed all so many children in the forest. And this is, of course, after the first man had done the same. So the power, uh, this this was would severely limit the power of the old gods as it seems really tied to nature. And wherever those natural elements are, you might see the old power of the old gods where they've been destroyed, which is pretty much everywhere in the south now. There is no power of the old gods. It's nowhere to be found. So since we have a habit of chronological bias, we could say, around here, the, when we move forward in the series to the next episode, the old gods are what we're going to be starting with. It won't just be one episode. We'll have more than one episode of the old gods. The first one's going to be on werewoods. Uh, but technically speaking, the old gods may not be the oldest religion we'll discuss. Uh, and it may not even be appropriate to call it a religion. Well, I mean, I think it is a religion, clearly, because the basic definition of a religion is the belief in worship of a superhuman power, and this qualifies, okay, yeah. but that's <laughs> besides the point, and we'll go with them first anyway, since they have the word old as part of their name. <laughs> that's, that's good fair. enough. <laughs> yeah, that's good yeah. enough. <laughs> and also, the series is rich with information in this area, unlike most of the other religions. We, yeah, probably, we know the most about the old gods, I feel, for yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I think so, too. Uh, we'll we'll discuss werewoods and heart trees, how their faces change. Yeah, changing faces is crazy. Mm -hmm. What has and what might be seen through their eyes, uh, the power that remains in their stumps even. Green seers and green dreams. Ravens and direwolves, skin changers and blood sacrifice. Blood raven's cave with all its bones and pits. Thoughts on the children in the forest and the others. Yep, the, the night fort, the black gate, the near but not complete lack of priesthood. Uh, but due to, due to that lack of priesthood, in fact, the closest thing we get in terms of a reaction to the comet from someone genuinely close to the old gods may be the direwolves, actually. And they react by howling at it. <laughs> Perhaps we need to learn more of direwolf psychology to go farther with that analysis. <laughs> Maester Lewin openly shrugs it off like Maester Crescent. But perhaps in his mind, he thinks otherwise, since he's speaking to a child. Yeah. Also, like Crescent, you don't want to scare the child. It means dragons. It means blood and fire. <laughs> yeah, they're coming to get uh, you. Yeah, yeah you're, you're right. You're going to die. It means your father's dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know? The worst thing you can imagine, kid. Yeah. Wolves often howl at the moon. These are howling at the comet. See how bright it is, Bran? Perchance they think it is the moon. 
When Bran repeated that to Osha, she laughed aloud. Your wolves have more wit than your maester, the wildling woman said. <laughs> they know truce the gray man has forgotten. The way she said it made him shiver. And when he asked what the comment meant, she answered, Blood and fire, boy, and nothing sweet. <laughs> A simpler interpretation comes from Lord Umber. The great John told Rob that the old gods have unfurled a red flag of vengeance for Ned. All right. Mm, I'll, that's a flag. I can buy that. Okay. I can buy that. <laughs> the great John is well known to be a ferocious and deadly fighter, but he's not a knight, which is an important distinction. It's not that knights are better. It's just that they are a, a religious thing there. That's, that's, you don't just get to be a knight because you decide to be, because you wear armor and the horse. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. So few Northmen are knights, as it is tradition of the seven. There are uh, a few, though, um, particularly with House Manderley, and some of whom, no doubt, give similar worship to both religions. When you live in the North, where the old gods are the most popularly worshipped, but your own religion is different, you might just choose one over the other, but I think a lot of people are going to go ahead and worship both. Mm -hmm. So what would these people who worship both think of the comet? Some might recognize that the old gods show real power, having lived amongst it and heard the stories, while the faith of the seven unlike the other major religions, reveals no overt supernatural or magical ability anywhere. Something what we will be getting into more in the Faith of Seven episode, why is there really no supernatural, supernatural aspect to it? You know, it comes in the origins of Faith of Seven. That said, though, they are by far the most influential and powerful in Westeros, not magically, but just plain influ influence and power. Yeah, the most number of people yeah. believe in them. Yeah, when we discuss the faith in earnest, we'll speak on how nicely certain characters fit into the roles as defined by the Seven, because it speaks to literary elements, and it's just good fun. Yeah. <laughs> We'd probably see Warrior the most, of course, mm, yeah. and many of them would be Knights, an institution that is a centerpiece of Seven worship, as yep. said. Mm -hmm. A knightly opinion on the comet comes from Ser Aris Oakhart while talking with Sansa. <laughs> the small folk have named it King Joffrey's Comet. Doubtless that was what they told Joffrey. Sansa was not so sure. I've heard servants calling it the dragon's tail. King Joffrey sits where Aegon the dragon once sat, in the castle built by his son, Ser Ari said. He is the dragon's heir, and crimson is the color of House Lannister, another sign. This comet is set to herald Joffrey's ascent to the throne, I have no doubt. It means that he will triumph over his enemies. The comet was red, but Joffrey was Baratheon as much as Lannister, and their sigil was a black stag on a golden field. Shouldn't the gods have sent Joff a golden comet? Hmm. No, they sent him something else. <laughs> there was no purple comet, but... <laughs> <laughs> Knighthood and chivalry will be discussed in depth uh, later in the series, mm -hmm. as well as some of its extensions and plenty of history to go along with it. A full episode on tournaments is forthcoming as well. Mm -hmm. The faith has also sprouted many groups and organizations, and we'll get into those. Mm -hmm. The Holy Hundred... 86. <laughs> the Warrior Sons, the Sparrows, and maybe guys like this. Corruption, the man cried shrilly. There is the warning. Behold the father's scourge. He pointed at the fuzzy red wound in the sky. From this vantage, the distant castle on Aegon's high hill was directly behind him, with the comet hanging forebodingly over its towers. A clever choice of stage, Tyrion reflected. <laughs> we have become swollen, bloated, foul. Brother couples with sister in the bed of kings and the fruit of their incest capers in his palace to the piping of a twisted little monkey demon. <laughs> I wonder who that is. <laughs> Highborn ladies fornicate with fools and give birth to monsters. Even the high septon has forgotten the gods. He bathes in scented waters and grows fat on lark and lamprey. While his people starve, pride comes before prayer, maggots rule our castles, and gold is all. But no more. The rotten summer is at an end, and the whoremonger king is brought low. When the boar did open him, a great stench rose to heaven, and a thousand snakes slid forth from his belly, hissing and biting. Jesus. <laughs> he jabbed his bony finger back at Comet and Castle. There comes the harbinger. Cleanse yourself, the gods cry out, lest ye be cleansed. Bathe in the wine of righteousness, or you shall be bathed in fire. Fire! <laughs> yeah. I, I wish that guy could make up his mind. He's really just... I would you know. I'm looking forward to in the show to seeing people chanting all around. That would be pretty cool. I know, I just, just hear the 
proselytizing and whatnot. Yeah, I think the religious uprisings, hopefully they can handle that pretty well whenever yeah. that happens in season yeah, I love seeing religious people give their speeches. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy. That kind of talk is what you might expect just before an uprising of some sort. Uh, not long after this speech, uh, Cersei becomes annoyed with the talk of men like that particular street preacher. <laughs> and going against the counsel she'd accepted earlier, which was... So, you know, going after a guy like that only proves that he, you don't want him saying what he's going to say. The best thing to do is ignore it. She had agreed with that when Tyrion brought that forward. In fact, Littlefinger agreed with it, too. When Littlefinger and Tyrion agree on something, that's probably <laughs> right. I mean, these guys are really smart. And Cersei went along with it. But she, you know, lost her cool and decided to start throwing several street preachers in the dungeon. So about half a dozen or so <laughs> wound up there. And following that, not too long after, was that big riot in King's Landing. The one that, ironically or poetically, killed some knights and the High Septon. <laughs> so, there, there you go. Beautiful. We can expect much worse now, though, uh, now that the faith is allowed military power again. That's a big difference. Yeah. They, they did all that damage with just a, just a bunch of peasants just yeah. getting angry. They didn't have weapons or anything. So now we have a, we're going to have to get into some predictions for what the rearming of the faith means. Mm -hmm. And another major topic will be the wars between the faith and the early Targaryen kings, like Aenys I, Magor the Cruel, and Jaehaerys the Conciliator. George says Aegon the Conqueror himself tread lightly where the faith was concerned. So... That's a pretty big deal. Yes. The Septons are a source of history, recording history alongside the Maesters. Mm -hmm. uh, just a case with religions across the world. The yeah. religious, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the High Septon was likely the most powerful man in Westeros before Aegon the Conqueror came. Still one of one of the most powerful after he came. Yeah. But mm -hmm. making the he made the political and military landscape much different in those times. The High Septons of those times probably never got torn apart by a mob. Probably not. No, probably they, not. They were a little more protected. We don't know important. what the old High Septon thought of the comet, nor his replacement. No idea. But we do have this scene in Winterfell with a, with a Septon. Bran asked Septon Shale about the comet while they were sorting through some scrolls snatched from the library fire. It is the sword that slays the season, he replied. And soon after, the White Raven came from Old Town, bringing word of autumn. So doubtless he was right. But of course, everyone all over the Seven Kingdoms knew it was getting colder, so, you know. That's our cats. I don't know if you could hear that, but that's <laughs> what that sound was. Uh, when discussing the faith, it's hard not to notice the parallel Seven Kingdoms, the seven aspects of God. Just because there is no actual connection doesn't mean that it isn't a great opportunity for propaganda. Easy enough to claim that the Smith shaped it that way, right? <laughs> you, can, you can get creative with those explanations. By comparison, the Iron Islands are much smaller, and even though their parallel continues due to the count of seven major islands there, they don't have room for seven gods. <laughs> Instead, they just make do with two. The Drowned God and the Storm God. Mm. The Ironborn are a stubborn people, set in their ways. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. This is reflected in their religious beliefs, and has been demonstrated over and over through their resistance to all attempts at conversion. The Andals didn't conquer the North, which is part of why the Seven never took over. But while the Andals did conquer the Iron Islands gradually, it was the conquerors who adopted the Drowned God. Of course, we hear from Aaron Damphair, who always <laughs> has a strict and narrow religious interpretation to offer. <laughs> He's told by Theon that the Greenlanders consider the comet a sign from their gods. A sign it is, the priest agreed, but from our god, not theirs. <laughs> a burning brand it is, such as our people carried of old. It is the flame the Drowned God brought from the sea, and it proclaims a rising tide. It is time to hoist our sails and go forth into the world with fire and sword, as he did. What a surprise. In the <laughs> same way that maesters are often found crafting rational explanations for the unexplained, priests of the Drowned God are often found crafting explanations for turning the unexplained into a reason for war. <laughs> Some people predict blood and fire. Aaron Dampere calls for it openly. <laughs> <laughs> we have drowning, their concept of the afterlife, and their beliefs, making them perpetually dangerous. Note that Makoro doesn't deny that the drowned god is real, merely that he's not a god, saying... Your drowned god is a demon, the black priest Makoro said afterward. He is no more than a thrall of the other, the dark god whose name must not be spoken. He might know, too, as there are also some similarities to R'hllor and the Great Other. The dualistic nature in particular. Yes. But why does the evil god in this dichotomy sound so much like a boss white walker, a great other? I mean, hmm. 
Uh-huh. Melisandre sees a vision of Bran, Bran and Bran? Of Bran yeah. and Bloodraven, and to her, they are servants of the Great Other. That's how she perceives them in her vision. Uh, looks like her compass might be off. I mean, she does think Stannis is Azor Ahai, so... Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of her other visions have been misinterpreted, too, but Makoro seems to have a perfect record so far, on the other hand, so... Mm. Mm-hmm. Really, Melisandre seems to interpret a lot of things wrong, but that hasn't stopped her from rising to power. Mm. She didn't, she didn't uh, approach Stannis directly, though. We have to keep that in mind. She kind of worked her way up, um, first of all, with Selyse Baratheon, who seems to have gone full zealot here. <laughs> Look out your windows, my lord! There is the sign you have waited for, blazoned on the sky. Red it is, the red of flame, red for the fiery heart of the true god. It is his banner, and yours. See how it unfurls across the heavens like a dragon's hot breath. And you, the lord of Dragonstone. It means your time has come, your grace. Nothing is more certain. You are meant to sail from this desolate rock as Aegon the Conqueror once sailed, to sweep all before you as he did. Only say the word and embrace the power of the Lord of Light. Stannis did embrace the power. In bed. (laughs) Spawning (laughs) shadows. Stannis was a bitter agnostic, not knowing if there were gods, but hating them if they were real. Mm. Not deserving of his worship because of what they did to his parents. Yep. But as a practical man, he recognized that Melisandre had legitimate power. He's not sure about Rulor, but he is sure about her. In bed. (laughs) Got me. He even tries to gaze into the flames himself a bit, it seems. I'm not sure if he sees anything, but... We'll compare Melisandre to Makoro and Thoros and explore raising the dead. Seeing the future in fire. Waking stone dragons, summoning winds. Burning people alive. Which causes those other things, <laughs> right? As well as a few other things about Ashai and the Red Temple itself as an institution. And the fact that Relorism is probably the most dominant world religion that we know of. Well, at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> there are other religions that we'll touch on. One who, ones whose histories are long and whose reactions to the comet are unknown. We'll make some wild guesses. Valyria... Whatever gods they had, and it seems there were a lot, three at least, <laughs> you'd think they'd be loving this comment. Yeah, you'd think so. Blood and fire is right <laughs> up their alley, right? The gods of Geese, not sure how to spin this so it fits the harpy, so I'm thinking they would fear it, or maybe they've got some sort of fire god we're <laughs> not aware of. Hmm, I don't know. <laughs> Great shepherd. Perhaps these peaceful people found a positive interpretation. Probably wrong, but good on them for trying. They might fear that all their sheep will catch fire. <laughs> <laughs> a whole flock of burning sheep running across the countryside. Uh-huh. Fearsome. <laughs> as long as the great, uh, as far as the great stallion goes, it seemed to be a good fit for Kyle Dogo's death, but other calls had to have reacted as well. They probably thought it was for them or something, uh, but they didn't uh, follow it into the red waste like Danny did. <laughs> so they knew, maybe they knew better. <laughs> the crones of the Dosh Kaleen seem to have some sort of foretelling ability, and, mm-hmm. uh, but, but we didn't get to see their reaction. The butterfly spirits of Nath. Flap towards the flame, maybe? <laughs> Fly mm. towards the light. The Summer Islands. I got no idea. Did it scare all the fancy birds away, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> of course, there are a host of religions to be found in Bravos. There's that word again. Yes. <laughs> As the founders... See, what? In? No, host. <laughs> oh, you weren't saying A? Uh, R? No. B, Q, P. As the founders were slaves who had been taken from a very wide variety of places. All wanted to honor their own own gods, and many of those temples are still to be found there, plus even more. The largest, even greater than that of R'hllor, is the Moonsinger's Temple. What's the deal with that? Uh, well, not a lot to say, but we'll, we'll say what we know. You know, singing get... at the moon sounds like the dire wolves, right? <laughs> it's just the wolf temple. <laughs> But no, the other most notable of the Bravosi temples is that of the many-faced god and the faceless men. We get to see quite a bit of them through Arya and in scattered other places, so we'll have a lot to say on that subject. We'll discuss the kindly man, the waif, Jaqen and his possible peculiarly different views, and perhaps his mission. Are the faceless men connected to the Iron Bank? Hmm. Have their powers increased since the comet? What's up with the creepy skin mask room? Yeah, seriously. Arya changed her face in there, but Jaqen simply did it. He didn't need a dressing room or anything like that. (laughs) Is there a similarity or connection between the concept of animal skin changing and this form of skin changing? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Ah, Good good enough term for it, I guess. Skin dot 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 changing <laughs> <laughs> you know i can't help but think of the the bolton skinning their the way they skin the flesh from their enemies and the whole wearing of skins as some sort of parallel 
They're not necessarily. I'm not saying they're connected directly, but as we're you know we're talking about the concept of certain magical elements being connected by some sort of ancient root or some sort of common element, or maybe they're drawing on the same power. I don't know. So we'll try to explore that connection potentially. Mm -hmm. Now, who, as far as getting back to Arya, who might she kill outside of her list? What's the impact of her concealing her skin-changing sk skills and needle? And who or what is Isambaro, which is where she's going next, either mm. to her or to that person or to that place? Did they cause the doom? Hmm, that's a good question. This is a good example of where magic and religion seem intertwined in many ways and can be difficult to tell them apart. Characters like Melisandre, who are called both Shadowbinder and Red Priestess, complicate the matter, as it can be difficult to discern which is which. Is one more powerful than the other? Um, she claims Relor gives her the gift of seeing the future in the flames, but are the shadows the product of her god of fire and shadow? So, maybe. Or of shadow binding. <laughs> Which yeah. is it? Are both? Yeah. Miri Mazdor doesn't seem to worship Relor, but she claims to have studied shadow binding in a shy, Melisandre's home, and clearly Miri had real power. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Yet Thoros of Mirror, a red priest of Relor himself, raises the dead repeatedly, or at least one dead person repeatedly, <laughs> without turning them into ve and he does it without turning them into vegetables like Miri did with Khal Drogo. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I wonder if Miri doing the ritual on Khal Drogo after the dragons were born would have been different. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe he'd have turned out some super beast like oh, Victorian's right. burned arm. Maybe mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe there's a connection there. That's true. But in any case, that power is m maybe more astonishing and and potent than a murderous shadow sent by Melisandre. Mm -hmm. Speaking of raising the dead, that's another connection we see across the board. The others raised the dead. Something or someone raised cold hands. We just mentioned Thoros for Beric, which Melisandre might do for John. Yeah. But there are other cases. Beric is an important symbol, not only for our, not only as a prime example for coming back to life, <laughs> uh, but also a man knighting people in the light of her lore, not the Seven. That's that's a little interesting. We'll also explore some thematic parallels between Lord Beric and Blood Raven. Mm -hmm. That a lot of you guys didn't consider that. <laughs> Melisandre and Makora also have peculiar similarities to Lord Beric. Yeah. Not needing sleep, food, or drink suggests an undead, undead slash semi-immortal fight. Yeah, and Melisandre's blood is black and smokes, yeah. too. What's up with that? It's like, it's like dragon blood. <laughs> Certainly something going on with those, too. Melisandre drank poison like it was nothing. Yeah. Makoro survived being adrift at sea for ten days. Sir Robert Strong was raised from the dead, or at least animated somehow, too. Could a god have anything to do with the knowledge required to create the Kyborg? Did Kyburn learn something new and crucial at Harrenhal? Maybe this is pure magic, some sort of necromancy. This is pure necromancy, perhaps. I don't know. Kyburn will get a lot of attention from us. He's uh, an interesting connection point between magic and... Uh, now, he's obviously not religious, but you know, there's a lot of things around him that we can use to compare to other forms of magic that are associated with religion. So it's an interesting uh, litmus test of, of sorts. And we try, we'll try not to overlap the things we've already talked about with regards to Kyburn in our Old Town in the Citadel episode, mm -hmm. which you should check out if you haven't. Yeah, you should. <laughs> Note, though, how P Thoros points out that R'hllor does the resurrecting, not himself. In all of these other cases, there's always a human performing the ceremony, spell, whatever. Yeah, whatever it is. With <laughs> that in mind, who raised Patchface? Mm, the sea raised Patchface. <laughs> Patchface is a product of the drowned god. No, <laughs> I, I don't really think that, but it's possible, I guess. But we'll touch briefly on crackpot theories, maybe like that one. Consider Aaron Greyjoy or even Davos. Davos seemed to actually drown, if you read his, uh, his drowning scene in Storm of Swords, or his memories of it, rather. And Aaron became a much different person after drowning. Now, that's entirely, that could entirely just be psychology, a life-changing event. But it could be paranormal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Another form of living on is the so-called second life of skin changers. We see this through Vermeer's point of view. We take a lot from that point of view, that prologue. Yeah, his death also seems to take him into nature itself. Like, he, when he dies, he feels himself, like, going into the rocks and trees and river. Like, he's becoming a part of nature. Which is, which echoes what we're kind of told about what the old religion of the old gods is. Like, a collective of consciousness and of continuum of nature and mm -hmm. life and all things as one. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds like hippie talk. <laughs> also, there's the notion that werewoods are inhabited by dead green seers. Does this count as godhood? 
Probably not. Uh, if you can be killed by an axe or a torch, you're probably not a, a god, but they're definitely powerful. Maybe more as a group Demi-god. than individually. <laughs> yeah. Demigod. Tree me god. <laughs> With so many of the supposedly god given and magically learned abilities seeming similar, we can't help but wonder at all these connections. Uh, here's a good example, a really good example, I think. Note what Danny sees of Miri Mazdur's ritual. Inside the tent, the shapes were dancing, circling the brazier and bloody bath, dark against the sand silk, and some did not look human. She glimpsed the shadow of a great wolf, and another like a man wreathed in flames. Shadow of a great wolf. Sounds like the old gods. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward, I think. Shadow of a man wreathed in flames. That's pretty clearly R'hllor, right? Why are these two different religious symbols appearing together like this? It's very puzzling. Maybe we even misinterpreted the symbols, but it seems pretty straightforward. Uh, comparison of that ritual to Victorian's burned arm ceremony is worthy as well. We'll cover that, like try to draw parallels between the descriptions of what's happening and maybe find some, mm-hmm. some fun stuff there. The comet also seems to coincide with Old Power's waking, either causing or triggered by the return of dragons to the world. Which is it? Mm. As the comet is interpreted in a variety of ways, so much be the forces of magic that exist on Planetos. Planetos. What, whatever. <laughs> I love the term Planetos yeah, for the what world. What else you supposed to call it? Westeros, Essos, Athorios. <sighs> Planetos. <sighs> whatever that may be. Uh, throughout the series, we'll draw parallels that may see, make it seem like there are no gods at all. Just forces that exist, which can be drawn upon by those who have learned or paid great prices. Now, if two different people living thousands of miles apart, or thousands of leagues apart, apologize, uh, consider, like, let's say they learned the same magical secret on their own. Like, consider the, th- thinking along the lines of, say, Chinese discovering writing, uh, whereas the Europeans discovered writing. They discovered independently, but it turned out very differently. They both write things down, but obviously mm-hmm. the languages are very different. So, mm-hmm. On the same, under the same auspices, if two different people kind of tap into the same magical energies, you wouldn't expect them to give it the same name, mm-hmm. having developed so far apart. Mm-hmm. That is why I worship the many-faced God. <laughs> All gods are but one face of him of many faces. Yeah, we're a, we're a many-faced God household here. <laughs> are you? Is many-faced God your, your God? I never asked you. I didn't know. <sighs> it's know. Oh, definitely mine. Out of all of them, my favorite. I don't think I have a favorite Not the God, God. of tits and wine. <laughs> okay, I like the God <laughs> of tits and wine. Yeah, that's my favorite. That's Tyrion. <laughs> I am the God of tits and wine. Yes. I worship Tyrion. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> So we'd expect that whatever, wherever these societies developed, they'd each start to explain and attach rituals and ceremonies surrounding these, you know, magical endeavors, whatever they are. Mm-hmm. So of co- over the course of these millennia, th- while these are essentially, potentially, essentially identical magics, they start to look a lot different potentially because... Potentially, essentially? Potentially, essentially. That's right. I made up a new two-term, two-word phrase there. <laughs> Uh, but they'd be packaged differently, evolving into things that seem different but actually aren't. Well, using a real-world scenario, imagine uh, g- the way natural gas works. Everyone pays for natural gas to heat their home. Well, m- almost everyone. And you may buy that natural gas from a variety of different companies, but they're all getting it from the same spot. It's okay. just this, it's the same gas. You're just paying, you have a choice of who to pay for it, but it's the same gas. So I, I like to use that analogy for what might uh, be going on in, in, the, in George's world as far as magic. They're tapping into the same source, but it looks different and they dress it up differently. It's mm-hmm. like different marketing companies. Of course, though, no matter the truth, in any world with real magic and no education, People will wind up believing a lot of crazy things. In any world without real magic and no education, people will believe a lot of crazy things. (laughs) Yeah, that's certainly true. (laughs) Some of the crazy things people in the series believe aren't so crazy. Others that seem like real magic are tricks. And a few others we're not so sure. It could be trick, could be magic, it might be We'll be doing a good deal of sifting through which is which. Yeah. The armorer Tabo Mott in King's Landing tells us he uses spells, and so do the pyromancers. The warlocks of Karth have their tricks and their drugs, yeah. but some real power as well. The House of the Undying showed legitimate visions, many of which came to pass. So they, you know, that's that's real, right? But even the Undying, in their friendly guise, tried to claim the comet. Yeah. We knew you were come to us, the Wizard King said. A thousand years ago, we knew and have been waiting all this time. 
We sent the comet to show you the way. <laughs> nice try, mummies. Drogon burned your weird blue heart. <laughs> they were using a combination of tricks and real magic there, it seems. But it was mostly tricks, as evidenced by the fact that they were their entire endeavor was undone by a baby dragon. <laughs> Springs is back to the person who seems to best combine the same kind of pseudo-magic with the no-doubt genuine article. With possible empowerment from a deity to boot. Mm -hmm. Melisandre. Melisandre. Through her, we have an internal discourse on telling fake magic from real magic. In the realm of tricks that appear as magic, for example, she tells us of powders that can cause a variety of effects and emotions. We'll show you a sneaky time or two when those were used. And we're not referring to times that she used them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, These are some sneaky things that, that George throws in there. You might think someone's reacting a certain way guess, based on what happened, but it turns out it was just because of some powder. <laughs> but in terms of real magic, Melisandre is quite likely concealing her own true appearance behind a glamour, as evidenced by the giant ruby and the fact that she makes numerous references to her life being really long, yet somehow she's stunningly beautiful and, and you know, usually don't associate being stunningly beautiful with being really old. <laughs> so... <laughs> There's also a, a ruby on the glamoured manse rattle shirt persona, and he seems to be somewhat controlled, but in a kind of a limited fashion by Mel. He's, he has most of his free will, but can't do some things. Mm. Hmm. Speaking of glamours, we'll touch on those as there seem to be examples in many places throughout the books, such as with Lightbringer, mm -hmm. and even in the Duncan Egg novellas. Yeah, back then even. Back then, mm -hmm. before then, whenever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Now, shadow binding seems real enough, though like other powers, it may have been weak before the dragons and or the comet, whichever started things, or who, who knows. But Melisandre was, like we said before, Melisandre was with Solis for a while, developing a relationship with Stannis later on. It's not clear if her powers were weaker and the enc enhancement, the boost she got, may gave her more credibility. Um, you know, that may have helped her get closer to Stannis, because after all, that's what Stannis ended up respecting, was her ability to actually get results. <laughs> that's not clear, though. Hmm. Mary Mastor summoned those puzzling dark shadows before the dragons were born yep. and before the comet came. Direwolves also appeared well before the comet. So, with yep. Mel, perhaps it's similar. similar. Now, Miri's magic also did bizarre things to Danny's child. Though, one other thing we'll get into during this series, more vicious teasings coming here, is that we have a new example that we recently learned from a reading uh, that George did at a convention that relates the concept of Danny's baby Rago, the way Rago looked like a part dragon and all that. But there's another example of this happening in the past. We'll tell you all about that one. So, mm -hmm. vicious teasing. <laughs> yeah. May not have been all about the blood magic. Right, that's the, the point there, yeah. yeah. Blood magic is a term we've heard in a few places, and there's a lot of crossover there as well, from leeches to the spell that required Varys' man manly parts. Mm hmm now, there's Miri's spells to those ladies who bathed in blood to preserve their youth. There's a few of those rumors mm -hmm. going around. Now, we're going, uh, and then we go all the way back to the activation of a heart tree, which apparently requires blood. Uh, the simulators are everywhere, and we'll detail them. We found some mild evidence that the blood of the person that goes into the heart tree affects the tree itself in a personal sense. The quality of the blood equates to the disposition of the tree, perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps. Perhaps. Melisandre demonstrated the power of Edric Storm's blood, for example. Or did she? <laughs> <laughs> it was Gendry's dick blood. What are you talking yeah. about? A show for life. <laughs> <laughs> now, who are some of the other characters that have royal or noble blood that could find themselves bur bur burned rather, or otherwise used in a ritual? Who else you can has also to look tell out? us who you want to see burned? Yeah. <laughs> Give us your most popular blood. You don't need to choices. say Joffrey, he's dead. Yeah, sorry, Joffrey. Maybe we should just bring him back to life just so he can be burned. <laughs> Now, the shadow babies, uh, along the lines of shadow, ba uh, shadow binding, are a good example of real magic. But there is more to it. Uh, what of the cost to Stannis? So he seems to have, because he seems to have aged and thinned because of his sleeping with Melisandre and it's creating shadow babies. Uh, yeah, Saying he's it's aged. true. His his pride is is damaged. We know he's a very <laughs> prideful guy. Well, I didn't say it to his face. <laughs> <laughs> now, who might be, uh, maybe an even better question is, who might be the next target of a shadow baby? She says that they're, that the shadow she can let loose at the wall would be terrible indeed. So, who's going to be the target of that? <laughs> hmm. Now, how is Melisandre able to... She's, she offered Davos a chance to participate in the creating of shadow babies. 
in bed. <laughs> but he doesn't have king's blood, or does he? I don't think so. But I mean, how could he's a slowborn smuggler? Is there? Is there? Is, are we supposed to? He's take a Targaryen. That? We're supposed to another <laughs> hidden Targaryen. Oh God, Davos is one. Are we supposed to think that he has noble blood in his background somewhere? Probably not. But how do we? You know, how do we? Their shadows would have been that soldiers, not assassins. They're uh. lowborn. If she can make, if she can make a lowborn soldier to go kill Renly, why did she need Stannis to do it? That's the part I don't know. So we'll have to we'll no, have to get into that. That was the assassin that. shadow, the king's shadows. Let's ah, the, yeah. the shadow that Davos can make will smuggle or, or yeah. go get. Uh, the Davos shadows are excellent at fetching onions. That's what they can do. They're not so good at assassinating. Good with getting food. <laughs> Fish too, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the shadow, though, couldn't penetrate the walls of Storm's End. It had to be birthed inside the castle. That's hence the need for Davos to smuggle Mel inside. Yeah. This shows that the walls are warded somehow. The same magic appears far north of the wall in the cave where Bran resides, except it's used to keep out whites and perhaps the others. In other words, the same sort of magic holding back the other servants is being used to keep out Melisandre's shadows and cold hands. Hmm. The wall itself is magical, preventing certain powers while enhancing others, too. Yeah, now, that's really peculiar. Mm -hmm. By the end of the series here, our series, not the books A Song of Ice and Fire series, although I would we'll think definitely by then we would also hope to know these answers, <laughs> but sooner than that, perhaps, we'll have a better idea of what these similarities and oppositions mean. Is Bran working for the Great Other or otherwise being led astray? Is Melisandre, maybe? Maybe she's completely on the wrong side and doesn't know. She claims she's more powerful at the Wall than even in Ashai. This includes her power to create shadows. If, if Blood Raven and the children at Storm's End... The children at Storm's <laughs> End? If the children and Storm's End, rather, are using magic to keep out shadows, how can we explain the fact that the Wall is helping Melisandre make them? That, isn't, that's just, that seems to conflicting and it mm -hmm. just, I don't know. That's John really loses his link to ghosts while they're on opposite sides, too. Yeah. The wall and Storm's End, though, are not the only structures with a magical association. We'll take a look at the possible magic in Winterfell, Harnhome, Harrenhal, and others. Yeah, there's a lot of little magical locations, so <laughs> to speak. At the start of this episode, supposedly, we, magic. supposedly some <laughs> of them may not be magic. Yeah, we'll have to separate the rumor from the fact there as best as we can. As the start of this episode, we pointed to Mel Saunders' view that the comet indicated dragon's breath. Mm -hmm. Though this may be a dragon chicken or the egg type question, the popular opinion seems to be that the birth of the dragon has caused a return or rise of magical forces. Uh, George himself has called the dragon birthing event miraculous. <laughs> Let's look at some, po some examples of this popular opinion. Yeah. First, from the pyromancer. When I was an acolyte, I'd asked him why so many of our spells seemed, well, not as effectual as the scrolls would have us believe. And he said it was because magic had begun to go out of the world the day the last dragon died. Interesting, though, this is said to Tyrion, and Tyrion's kind of our series expert on dragons, and this notion didn't mean anything to him. He, <laughs> didn't, he didn't respond at all to the idea that dragons are the source of magic or a sign of it. So, I don't, but I'm not sure what to make of that, but it's interesting to, uh, if we're going at both sides, we need to point that out. Now, Bran himself had asked a number of people their opinion on the comet, and we've included those throughout the episode. But the person who he went to last was Old Nan, and she disagreed with everyone else. And she'd lived longer than any of them. Dragons, she said, lifting her head and sniffing. She was near blind and could not see the comet, yet she claimed she could smell it. <laughs> it be dragons, boy, she insisted. Old Nan tends to be right about things, doesn't she? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So Danny has this same thing told to her face by Quaif when speaking of a street magician. And now his powers grow, Khaleesi, and you are the cause of it. Furthermore, the glass candles now function, whereas before they did not. That's more straightforward. Yeah, that, a, a magical yeah. device that doesn't work, and now it does. Yeah. <laughs> that's not like, maybe you were doing it wrong before. <laughs> that is, that's really straightforward. The warlocks and street magicians have powers they didn't have before. We saw that in a couple of places. And we've named many others already before in this episode, so the list is already pretty long there. Corrin Halfhand even indicates that the rise in magic includes the powers associated with the old gods, as he gives a desperate order to the ranger Stone Snake. Make for the fist. Tell Mormont what John saw and how. Tell him that the old powers are waking, that he faces giants and wargs and worse. Tell him that the trees have eyes again. Mm, that's the really again. telling line. Tell him that the trees have eyes again. Mm -hmm. The comet may have inspired people to act, 
But the dragons will also do that and cause a huge ripple effect on the world through the return of magic if if they're indeed to blame. So uh, twofold there. <laughs> if, the, if magic has been restarted, what ended it? Yeah, that's a good question too. Did the dance of the dragons essentially end magic, so to speak? How much of a role did the maesters play? Are there or were there dragons in Ashai or elsewhere? Bran sees a vision while in his coma... That indicates there are dragons in Eshai. He sees them waking beneath the shadow or something along those lines. But if that's true, why would Quaith, who's from Eshai, make the journey to Karth to see the only living dragons that had just been birthed by Daenerys? Lyria does claim Danny's eggs came from Eshai. Yeah, the dragons certainly were there at some point, but uh, evidence that they still exist there is... I think I think I think we can say that probably not. The evidence is. I think we can say that we certainly direction. don't think that they're there. That's yeah. That's our opinion at this point. Um, we'll be able to discuss more about how dragons are normally born and the bonding and writing process as well. That'll be a big topic. Uh, we may do a whole episode on dragons. There are yeah, certain magical creatures. Will. That fits. We'll, we'll we'll hold that episode off. We'll go through the old gods, and then once we finish that, it should be December. Yeah, by then the Princess of the Princess Queen of the will be Queen, out. And so. we'll have, well, well, one, we'll have to devote an episode to that, but we can separate out the dragon stuff and have an episode for that. And it may give us more insight into another working theory that we have entertained. I'm not, I wouldn't mm -hmm. say that we are big on it, but it's certainly interesting and there's a connection there. And that is the notion that bonding with the dragon is somewhat similar to what happens with a war bond mm -hmm. with its animal, mm -hmm. maybe. Uh-huh. Uh, Maester Aemon, blind, sees the comet and dragons together in his mind's eye. The last dragon died before you were born, said Sam. How could you remember them? I see them in my dreams, Sam. I see a red star bleeding in the sky. I still remember red. I see their shadows on the snow, hear the crack of leathern wings, feel their hot breath. My brothers dreamed of dragons too, and the dreams killed them. Every one. Sam... We tremble on the cusp of half-remembered prophecies, of wonders and terrors that no man now living could hope to comprehend, or... Or, said Sam. Or not. <laughs> Such a funny quote to me. <laughs> or not. Or not. <laughs> the maester totally, yeah. totally working Sam there. Oh, Amon's, the old psych. <laughs> Amon's dreams, and those of others, are of course a crucial topic, mm -hmm. as some are the foreshadowing type, and some are magical in origin type. That's internally and externally, as in what I mean by that is in some dreams are the product of an innate talent, like some people are dragon dreamers or green dreamers, and others are caused by where the person happens to put their head when sleeping. Jamie comes to mind, and mm -hmm. one of his famous dreams is related to where he was sleeping. That's a sneaky one. <laughs> Visions and dreams are cousins, and we'll connect the dots between the different predictive abilities of the red priests... The Green Dreamers, the Dragon Dreamers, yeah, the Warlocks, the Dosh Kaleen, Maggie the Frog, Brandon and Coma, etc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The biggest driver of both story and character action falls under this general topic umbrella of dreaming and foretelling. We're speaking of prophecy. Quite possibly the subject we've had requested the most often. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> prophecy and Saviors is in sight now, folks. <laughs> In ancient books of Ashai, it is written that there will come a day after a long summer when the stars bleed and the cold breath of darkness falls heavy on the world. In this dread hour, a warrior shall draw from the fire a burning sword, and that sword shall be Lightbringer, the red sword of heroes, and he who clasps it shall be Azor Ahai, come again, and the darkness shall flee before him. It seems as though Daenerys has already wakened dragons from stone, but the prophecy maintains a real effect on the world despite this, because... Others do not think it is fulfilled. Yeah. So many still look for a savior. As the comet has so many names, so does the name of the mythical savior that is told of in so many ways and by so many cultures. Azor Ahai, the last hero, the prince that was promised, the stallion who mounts the world, others, I guess. That's is this the same? <laughs> That's right. Others... <laughs> Uh, and is, is this the same legend told by different cultures with a common origin in a manner consistent with our theory about magic being a universal force? In the real world, dozens of different cultures have a myth about the flood, the great flood. It's in the Bible. It's in, well, I'm not thinking of any others off the top of my head, but there's a lot of them. It's not just in the Bible. That's something we'll pay special attention to. When the red star bleeds and the darkness gathers... Azor Ahai shall be born again amidst smoke and salt to wake dragons out of stone. Misreading be a delicious ham. <laughs> yeah, delicious ham. Meeting, uh, rather, misreading prophecy is also a major driver of events. So we'll have to go through some of the misreads and the prophecies that were not nearly what anyone thought. 
A misinterpretation caused the mysterious tragedy of Summerhall, most likely. That's mm -hmm. pretty straightforward, I think. Archmaester Marwin the Mage illuminates us on this topic. Born amidst salt and smoke, beneath a bleeding star, I know the prophecy. Not that I would trust it. Gorgon of Old Geese once wrote that a prophecy is like a treacherous woman. She takes your member in her mouth, and you moan with the pleasure of it, and think, how sweet, how fine, how good this is. And then her teeth snap shut, and your moans <clears throat> turn to screams. Ow. That is the nature of prophecy, said Gorgon. Prophecy will bite your prick off. Every time. There's a lot of and talk. Then he chews. <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's a lot of talk about blowjobs in this episode. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, Theon. I was like, oh, <laughs> Theon. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. folks. I guess this one's PG 13. <laughs> Rhaegar. You know, because we have all sorts of 10 year olds watching our episodes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> hey, if there can be a 10 year old commander of the Lord, uh, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, they can handle yeah, there's the, a little girl A little blowjob mm -hmm. talk. Rhaegar himself, due to misinterpretation, may have indirectly caused Robert's Rebellion, in, in addition to the people before him causing Summerhall. And this caused, and he also may have caused his side to lose Robert's Rebellion due to his obsession or inability to see that he was wrong. Yeah. But he was not the first Targaryen to do so. And to be fair to Rhaegar, we must not forget that the Targaryens only exist today at all because they listened to a previous dream slash prophecy that told them the doom was coming mm. to get them. Dana the Dreamer. The one who predicted it must have predicted many things correctly prior to that for Aenar to listen to her. It's a bold step to abandon a, a powerful position in the most powerful city in the largest state the world has ever seen. In yeah. fact, <laughs> we we're told that the flight to Dragonstone made the Targaryens la a laughing stock. They had the last laugh, though, though I doubt they were truly happy about the destruction of Valyria. I'm glad they, 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 a part of them probably were like, yeah, see, we told you so. But in a sense, Dana and Aenar, those were the two who brought the Targaryens over. They were the saviors of their own family in, in a certain light, and of the dragons. Mm -hmm. But not all prophecies deal with saviors. Of course, we will discuss Patchface's prophecies. Those of the ghost at the high heart, that's the dwarf woman with the red eyes that uh, mm -hmm. sings and gets upset with Arya mm -hmm. for being so dark. <laughs> the House of the Undying. Mm, that's a big one. Danny's other visions, too, along with Quaith and stories from Old Nan and whatever else we didn't mention just now. We're not prophets ourselves, but we predict it will be great and fun. <laughs> yeah. yes. uh, now, so for fun here, uh, as we're getting close to the end, we're going to present all the comet nicknames and references in mm -hmm. one place. King Joffrey's Comet from the King's Guard in court. No doubt Renly's people found a way to call it his, too. Yeah, they found a way somehow to call that comet Renly. <laughs> uh, splendor and glorious as it was, I'm sure Renly was like, oh, yeah, it's beautiful and wondrous. It's got to be for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Red Keep servants were calling it the Dragon's Tail. Mm -hmm. The Red Sword, according to Gendry. Yep, now, of course, we have the Red Messenger, both from the King's Landing common folk and the River Run men, Brendan Tully and Edward's men, all of them. I like this one. The sword that slays the season from Septon Chael. Yeah. Um, Danny's Kalasar was calling it the Bleeding Star, or maybe the Dothraki mm -hmm. General were calling it that. Mm -hmm. Mormont's Torch from the Night's Watch. The Father's Scourge from that preacher in King's Landing who also called it the Harbinger. And the dude can't mm -hmm. really make up his mind, I guess. Also, but without nickname, Azor Ahai's Herald from Selys and Melisandre. Arya saw it as ice bleeding with her father's blood. A red flag of vengeance for Ned also. Uh, Ed Muir thinking it's a tull it represents Tully colors. That's right. And we have Danny, Theon, and Crescent all having various uh, ideas for them that they think mm -hmm. it's kind of for them. <laughs> Blood and fire. Osha. Right. And then we have uh, Dragon's Breath from Melisandre. Mm -hmm. dragons, uh, dragons from Old Nan. Yeah, and Dragon's Question Mark from Pyromancer Helene. Um, so, mm -hmm. and of course Tyrion's lack of reaction yeah. there. We have Drogo's Ride to the Nightlands. Mm -hmm. and, but the other old man of Danny's Kalasar considered it a bad omen. Also a bad omen thinker is Jano Slint. <laughs> we put a lot of stock in Jano Slint, but I think <laughs> he's right there. And our final opinion of the episode, and an actual quote in and of itself. Come mm -hmm. to think of it, this entire episode was, was a waste, actually. <sighs> I should just scrap Be it. Well, yeah, this, the one true prophet explained the whole comet, religion, magic, and prophecy phenomena in one word mm -hmm. when he was asked by Bran. Mm -hmm. Hodor. Hodor! Yes. 
Hodor, Hodor. Hodor, Hodor, Hodor. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's so, it for today, folks. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm. This was another episode of History of Westeros podcast. Be sure to rate us on iTunes, comment on YouTube. Uh, we've got some really nice iTunes uh, ratings recently, and we have to thank you guys for that. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the feedback. Yes. It's really good. Keeps us going. Yes, it does. Well, there'll be a, do- a link for donations at the on the on this page here and in the description if you're listening to this for uh, on audio only. Um, check us out on Facebook, of course. Yeah, facebook.com slash Westeros History. We really don't need us. I guess iTunes, we should say it out loud still. <laughs> we have them all linked in the YouTube comment, in the YouTube description. That's right. But you guys on iTunes, if you're listening to just this episode, well, you can also <laughs> check us out on Twitter at twitter.com slash Westeros History. That's right. We're on Tumblr yeah. as well, westeroshistory.tumblr.com. Or history, history of, of Westeros. Westeros, I'm sorry. History yeah. of Westeros.tumblr.com. Mm-hmm. And we're still working on a website. Uh, Shay's making a lot of progress on that. Done. We're getting close to that. Yeah, looking good, looking and, good. Um, Can't wait to show that to you guys. If you have, if as we said at the beginning of this episode, if during this episode y- we did mention a topic that you think we should be covering in religion, mm. drop us a comment, send us an email, whatever way you prefer to contact us, and let us know that you want an episode or you want to make sure we hit on a certain point. Yeah, yeah. Yes. There's a lot of uh, a lot of things that we could. Eat. It's, obviously, it's a very large topic. Religions, magic, prophecy, all that is a huge topic. It'll ca- take us several episodes. We haven't figured out how many yet. Mm-hmm. But so this, it would be a surprise if we didn't miss a few things. So <laughs> you know, don't don't uh, don't be shy. Uh, let us know even if you just think we might have missed something. We we may have just we may actually not have forgotten it and just have it written down somewhere. Mm-hmm. But just to be safe, we like the feedback anyway. So uh, go ahead and let us know. Mm-hmm. So that's all. That's mm-hmm. a wrap. We're Until hist- next time. Mm-hmm. We're History of Westeros podcast. <laughs>